साधु 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 नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समुस् Homage to the blessed one, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us pay our respect to our teacher, Most Venerable Sri Badbara Yana and the Tero Pingatlo Kusami Nase, for teaching us the supreme. teachings of the gautam buddha sadhu 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 namo buddhaye meritorious devotees today also we are going to learn the teachings of the buddha so we have to understand that uh, it is a buddha who teaches us of the reality of life the journey we have come in the sanskar and uh, the things we learn in the suttas which is the buddha system his realization is something you cannot learn by any other means therefore it is very precious the teachings of the buddha so think of any being whether in the heaven whether in the brahma world in the hell world the human world all of these beings within them there is a constant phenomena that is happening all the time which we call the dependent origination which means how the sansaric suffering is ongoing this ongoing process of dependent origination is there in every being whether it is in the brahma world devas world animal world in the hell world wherever there is a birth that is because the existence of a being because of dependent origination and dependent origination it begins with what it begins with ignorance ignorance is the first link so as long as we do not free ourselves from this ignorance we will be born again and again and again and suffer because with birth you have to suffer the whole mass of suffering aging sickness death sorrow lamentation likewise whole mass of suffering is there so once buddha said monks there are places in this world where there is no sun there is no moon is pitch darkness then monks ask the buddha buddha are there any other places where is more darker there is even more dark then buddha say yes if a person has not realized these teachings where there is ignorance total ignorance lack of any understanding that is the darkest moment that is pitch darkness say the buddha so as long as a person do not realize the dependent origination and free himself from ignorance craving then he lives in darkness so it is the teachings of the buddha is the light light is wisdom darkness is ignorance so it is through the teachings of the buddha by having his wisdom as the guidance that we can find the light so it is phenomenal the buddha's 
that uh, what the Buddha achieved on him himself, what he realized on his own, and what he taught to free many beings from this samsaric journey. And today, so we have to learn the nature of the teacher, our teacher, the Buddha to whom we have gone for refuge. And today in this sutta also, we get a chance to learn, to recognize, to understand, to familiarize ourselves, to grow in faith towards the Buddha. So this beautiful sutta is rather lengthy and there are certain at the end like some profound Dhamma points. So we will cover what we can and what we can actually understand because some points are really deep. So the name of the sutta is uh, it's the great discourse to Sakuludai. Okay. So this is how it begins. Thus have I heard. So when this happened on one occasion, the Blessed One was living near Rajagaha. Okay. In the bamboo grove in the squirrel's sanctuary. So at the same time, these wanderers were also living in Rajagaha. It says here now on that occasion, a number of well-known wanderers are staying at the Peacock Sanctuary, the Wanderers Park. Who are they? That is uh, Annabhara, Varadhara, and also the wanderer Sakuludai. So it is after this uh, wanderer Sakuludai that the Sutta is named after him, as well as other well-known wanderers. So then in the morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his ball and outer robe, went to Rajagaha for arms. Okay, so the Buddha goes for arms to Rajagaha. Then he thought, it is too early for me to go for arms to Rajagaha. So this happens from time to time. When it's too early, Buddha and even his disciples, uh, they would go to uh, another dwelling or a monastery of uh, other ascetics. So in this case also the Buddha thought, suppose I went to the wanderer Sakuludai in the peacock sanctuary, the wanderer's park, because it was too early it seems to go for arms. Then the Blessed One went to the peacock sanctuary, the wanderer's park and now on that occasion the wanderer Sakuludai was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar, loud noise, talking among them very loud. So there was a lot of noise. Okay. And it was not, it was just idle chatter, pointless talk. So what were they talking? What are the Buddha has pointed out 32, we know the pointless talks. What are they? We say Rajakata. Rajakata means talking about kings. Chorakata, talking about bandits or thieves. Then Mahamatta Kata, talking about ministers. Sena Kata, talking about armies. Then Bhayakata, talking about scary things like ghost stories, likewise. Okay, because there is some uh, pressure there, no? Pressure bond of delusion. Fear also can be a form of pressure. That is why people watch for horror movies. Okay, there is pressure there. So that is why they engage in such talk. Bhaya kata, scary things. Yuddha kata, talking of wars. Anna kata, talking of food. Pāna katan, talking of drink. Vata katan, talking of clothes. Yāna katan, talking about... Yāna katan is vehicles, vehicles. You know, people talk about these things, no? About cars, the newest model, what you can afford, what you cannot afford, but still you, you might not be able to afford it, but still you want to 
talk about it. No? You love talking about this. Sayanakata, talking about beds and furniture and household thing. Malakata, talking about garlands. Now, nowadays, it would be like necklaces, this stuff. Gandhakata, talking about fragments. Nyatikata, talking about relatives. Gamakata, talking about villages. Nigamakata, talking about towns. Nagarakata, talking about cities. Janapadakata, talking about countries. Ittikata, talking about women. Purisakata, talking about men. Surakata, talking about heroes. Visikhakata, talking about roads. Kumbhatanakata, that means talking at the bathing spot, at the well or water. When people get together, they talk about certain topics, no? And these uh, ascetics were talking like this is what they, you know, they talk about this. They, when they were at the well, when they were at the water spot or the bathing spot, like that. that is talking about the dead. Nanatakata. In this way, I will talk on various matters. Then Loka Kaika, that is uh, talk about the world, Samudha Kaika, talk about the sea, Iti Bhava Bhava Katan, talk about being reborn in this or that state of existence. All this together. That is pointless talk, idle chatter. So, though they were ascetics, they wanderers. That is how they were spending their day. Early morning, they were talking among themselves loudly. These 32 types of talk, idle chatter, pointless talk. Then, Sakuludai, the wanderer, he sees the blessed one coming in the distance. And then he say. He quieted his own assembly, saying, Sirs, be quiet, sirs, make no noise. Here comes recluse Gautama. This venerable one likes quiet and commands quiet. So, Buddha praised silence. He liked to be silent and he praised and encouraged others to be silent as well. So wonder when they saw the Buddha, Sakuludai said, pipe down. No, he wanted them to quiet. Because Buddha, they knew that Buddha and also the Buddha's disciple. There are cases in some suttas when they see disciples of the Buddha, lay disciples even. These wanderers, they would stop their talk and remain silent out of respect because they knew that uh, the Buddha and all his disciples. They loved quiet wood. Okay. Perhaps if he finds our assembly a quiet one, he will think to join us, they thought. So the wanderers they became silent, and the blessed one went to the wanderer Sakuludai and said to him, Let the blessed one come, venerable sir, welcome to the blessed one. So they welcome the Buddha. And says it is long since the Blessed One found an opportunity to come here. Let the Blessed One be seated. The seat is ready. So Blessed One, the Buddha sat down on the seat that was made ready for him. And the wanderer Sakludan, he himself took a lower seat. When he had done so, then he asked the Buddha. So the Buddha asked him actually, what were you discussing before I came here? Then he said like, never mind what we were talking. They are just pointless talk, venerable sir. Let be the let be the discussion for which we are now sitting together here. So he wanted to change the subject. The blessed one can well hear about what we are talking because they are just idle chatter, chatter, pointless talk. In recent days, venerable sir, so he is telling about something that happened very recently to the Buddha. In recent days, venerable sir. When recluses and Brahmis of various sects have been gathering together and sitting together in the debating hall, they are wrote this topic. Recently, the Brahmis of various sects had gathered in the debating hall. Okay, so in this hall, and they had uh, 
discuss a certain matter. So this topic had come up. So he says, uh, when I was led with the discussion for, she says, it is a gain for the people of Ang and Magadha. So this is what they talk. What is the gain? It is a great gain for the people of Ang and Magadha that these recluses and Brahmins, heads of other groups, teachers of groups, well-known and famous founders of sects regarded by as regarded by many as saints, have come to spend the ranks at Rajagar. So this was the time for the ranks. So many renowned teachers who had many disciples under them, under their guidance, tutelage, were residing at this time. They all had taken reins in where? In Rajagha. And they thought it, it was a, really a gain for the people of Ang and Magadha that so much will renown, reputable uh, teachers, heads of groups, recluses and Brahmins had taken up things in Rajagha. And who are they? They are this Purana Kasapa, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, a well known, well known and famous. Who else? Makkali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kamvali, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanjay Bellati Putta and Nigantanata Putta. So they were very famous, these six. They were called the six great uh, teachers at that time. They were renowned in India for their teachings and they were respected. So they had also, it seems, uh, taken up reigns in Rajagha. And they had also talked about the Buddha, it says here. There is also this, recl re this recluse Gautama, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, the well-known and famous founder of sect regarded by many as a saint. He too has come to spend the reigns at Rajagha. Okay, then they went on to talk. Now among these worthy recluses and Brahmins, heads of orders, regarded as saints by many, who is honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples. And how honoring and respecting him do they live in dependence on him? So they talked about themselves when they gathered in this hall of these, uh, all these uh, renowned recluses and Brahmins, who is honored, respected, and revered by their disciples who live in dependence of their teacher. Okay, This was the question that arose. So thereupon some said this, so then they had said, someone then had said, thereupon someone had said, this Purana Kasap is the head of an order regarded as seen by many, yet he is not honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples. Though he is a popular teacher, and regarded to be a saint, his disciples, they do not respect or honor him. He's not venerated by his disciples, nor do his disciples live in dependence on him, nor do they honor and respect him. And he goes on to say that person had said in the assembly, once Purana Kasapo was teaching his Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers. Then a certain disciple of his made the noise. Says, do not ask Purana Kasapa this question. He does not know that. We know that. Ask us the question. We will answer for you. When he was addressing assembly, one of his disciples stands up and tell to the people who are there in the gathering, look, don't ask him that question. Ask us. We will let you know. We know better than our Teacher. It happened that Purana Kasap did not get his way. Though he waved his arms and wailed, be quiet, sirs, make no noise, sirs. They are not asking you, sirs. They are asking us. That means they are asking me. So he's trying to silence his disciple. Look, he's asking me. You don't intervene. We will answer. That means I will answer, he said. Indeed, many of his disciples left him after refuting his doctrine in this manner. You do not understand this Dhamma and discipline. I understand this Dhamma and discipline. How could you understand this Dhamma and discipline? 
your way is wrong, my way is right. I am consistent, you are inconsistent. So likewise, they were refuting their teacher. What should have been said first, you say last. What should have been said last, you say first. What you had so carefully thought of has been turned inside out. Your doctrine is refuted. You are proved drawn. Go and learn better. For disentangle yourself if you can. So you see, there is no, not a semblance of respect, no? towards their teacher. Thus, Purana Kasap is not honored, respected, revered, and venerated by their, by his disciples. Nor do his disciples live in dependence on him. Because they left him, no? Honoring and respecting. Indeed, he is scorned by the scorn, sown to his dumb. So he and his teachings were scorned by his own disciples. And at the same time, someone said the same thing about Makkali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kambali, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanjay Bellatiputta Nigantranatu. They had also experienced the same situation when they were addressing a certain assembly where their own, his, their own and his, uh, students had turned against them and talked disrespectfully, defaming them. Okay, and refuted their teachings. So they had no respect. Okay, and then another person in the assembly had said this. Someone had said, This recluse Gautama, he said of an order, a teacher of a group, well known and famous, and known to be a great saint. But in his case, he is honored, respected, revered venerated by his disciples and his disciples living dependence on him honoring and respecting him isn't that the case with us true no we never disrespect our teacher the buddha once the recluse gotham was teaching his dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers and there are a certain disciple of his clear this throat when Buddha was teaching the Dhamma to several hundred, a group of a large group of people, someone cleared his throat. And hereupon, one of his companions in the uh, assembly nudged him with his knee to indicate they are monks, and another monk, when he cleared his throat, the other monk nudged him with the knee and said, Be quiet, Venerable Sir, make no noise. The Blessed One, the teacher, is teaching us the Dhamma. So see the extent of the respect. Sometimes when you do this, it's involuntary when you clear your throat. But still they want him to be silent out of respect to the teacher. When the recluse Gautam is teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred fellows on that occasion, there is no sound of his disciples coughing or clearing their throats. That was the respect so on to the Buddha. For then that large assembly is poised in expectancy. Let us hear the Dhamma the Blessed One is about to teach. Just as though a man, this is a beautiful simile, just as though a man were at a crossroads pressing out pure honey and a large group of people were poised in expectancy so too. Just like when a person was from a honeycomb squeezing out honey at crossroads, people would flock around him and eagerly waiting for their share. Likewise, when the Buddha is teaching, his followers eagerly listen to him, to the teachings, listen to his teachings without any noise. You can hear even a pin drop. That where there, there was an occasion when, when a certain, I don't remember who the king was, when the king was brought to meet, he was uh, another person, takes him to meet the Buddha. And Buddha is in the forest hermitage, in the forest monastery. And there's a total silence. I think there was like a retinue of thousand monks with the Buddha, maybe. I think in the Mahapurnama Sutta, I don't quite remember. 
So the king gets scared. He thinks that he was being led to a trap. Why, if there was so much of a large group like that, thousands of bug, but there is no noise. Utter silence. Buddha and the Arahans, the monks were there. So the king got scared because they are, they are, it was, they are so silent. They are so silent. So that was the nature. That was the respect shown by the disciples of the Buddha toward him. Okay. So they were expectant to learn, listen to the Dhamma that Vasudha would teach. And even those disciples of his who fall out with their companions, because some though they live the monk life for various reasons, they fall, they disrobe. So abandon the, they abandon the training and return to the lay life. They become lay person. Even they praise the master and the Dhamma and the Sangha. When a person disrobe, leave the dispensation, still they praise the Buddha. They praise the teachings. They praise the order of monks. And they blame themselves. How do they blame? Mayame, mayame vetta alakka. Mayang appu punya. It's my loss. Because I didn't have enough merits to lead the monk's life. So they are say we were unlucky. We have little merit. For though we went forth into the harmless life and we ordained in such a well-proclaimed dispensation in the Dhamma, we were unable to live the perfect and pure holy life for the rest of our lives. We failed. They never blamed the Buddha. They never blamed the Dhamma, the teachings or the Sangha. So it's quite different nowadays when a person disturbed though, no? They blame the institute. Either they blame the teacher. Why? People have declined in the humane qualities. Here, even they, even when they disturb, still they have the groundwork necessary to develop in the path. And they then he thinks, they say here, having become monastery attendants or lay followers, they undertake and observe the five precepts. They don't decline totally. They either become monastery attendants. They live in the monastery as attendants. They don't leave the monastery. If they do live and become live a normal lay life, still they keep the five precepts. Nowadays, when a person disrobes, they don't keep either the five precepts. No precepts for them. There's a rapid decline. So they undertake and observe the five precepts. Then the recluse Gautam is honored. Thus, in this way, the recluse Gautam is honored, respect, and revered. And disciples live in dependence on him. But then Buddha says, But Udai, how many qualities do you see in me because of which my disciples honor, respect me, and revere and venerate me, and live in dependence? So, Udai, what are the qualities you see in me because of which my disciples respect, honor me, and live in dependence of me? What are the things you see? Buddha asked him. Then Buddha tells five things that he sees as the reasons why the Buddha is respected by his disciples. First thing is he says, Blessed one is little and comments. Eating little. So Buddha eats a little, he says. And you praise eating a little. That is why they respect you. That is why your disciples respect you. Then he says, Blessed one is content with any kind of robe. We don't mind wearing any kind of robe. Whether it's fine or coarse. So therefore, they praise you. They, they are, and you praise wearing any kind of robe. Therefore, your disciples respect you. They honor you for that reason as well. Third reason he points out is, Blessed One is content with any kind of arms food. You are content with whatever arms food you get. And you praise living such a life. 
Besadwani is content with any kind of resting place. You don't mind what type of kuti you have, what type of dwelling you live in. And you praise living in such a way. Fifth is Blessed One is secluded and commands seclusion. You like to dwell in seclusion and you praise living in seclusion. So these are the five things. Udayin thought as the reason for the Buddha to be respected by his disciples. What is the first thing? That the Buddha eats little, no? You eat little, then would wear any kind of robe and uh, accept any type of any sort of arms food. Then what else? Any kind the of robe? Kind of arms food? Yeah, any kind of kuti. And that because Buddha lived in seclusion. Seclusion. So then Buddha says, Suppose Sudai, my disciples, honored and respected and lived in dependence of me with the thought that Reclus Gautam eats little and commits eating little. If that is the reason, that because I eat, little, eat a little and praise eating a little, if that is the reason that my disciples actually respects me, now there are disciples of mine who live on a cup full or a half a cup full of food. Or bill of fruits or a half a bill of fruits. You know what? Bill of fruit, bail, bail, B A E L. You can Google if you are not seen. In single, it's belly. English, it's bail or uh, bill of fruit. Or half a bill of fruits, quantity of food. Okay? That means that's the size. Think of an apple, size of an apple, that much of food. While I sometimes eat with arms food filled, but in my case, Buddha said, sometimes I eat, my arms bowl is full, oh. all, almost to the brim. And even more, sometimes I have. So he says, so if my disciples honored and respected because I ate a little, then those disciples of mine who live in a cup full of food will not live honoring and respecting me. Isn't that true? It's true, no? If that is the reason why you respect and honor Buddha, when they see the Buddha sometimes eating that much, more than themselves, they would not respect him. That's what Buddha says here. Then Buddha goes on to say, suppose Sudai, my disciples respected me because I wear any kind of robes because I'm content with any kind of robe and commend spaces wearing such robes. Now there are disciples of mine who are refused rank wearers. Wearers of coarse robes. They collect rags from the charnel ground. Rubbish sheets or shops make them not shops, that is the wrong translation. They, they would go find uh, pieces of uh, clothes from channel grounds, shabby sea, whatever, discard. Okay? Because you, you didn't have clothes in shops, those days. Okay? That is why, like this, in the rain street, we have three was season, and after the end of the was season, we have Chivara Mas, we call it. That is the month that is set out to soothe the uh, robes. So, why do you need the month? In those times, we didn't have a textile in, in those days. There wasn't textile industry. So you didn't, you didn't get ready-made cloth. Sometimes monks were offered cotton, whereas they had to take it to the cotton to the thread maker. Then he would wove the threads, weave the threads. Then the thread, once the thread is made, the thread has to be taken to the person who then weaves it so that it makes cloth. Then the monks has to sew the clothing and then they have to make the robe. So this takes, this is a long process. So there was a month after the last season where we call the month where you prepare the robes before you again uh, wander from place to place. So it was not a common commodity those days, the clothing. 
So in the case of monk, the robes. So Buddha said, if that is the case, then there are my disciples who wear, they are, who are refused tag wearers. Whereas coarse robes, they collect tags from the charnel ground, likewise discarded things, and they make patched robes and wear them. They would suit them together and wear them. But I sometimes wear robes given by household. Buddha accepts when people offer robes to him, he would accept them. Uh, so in that case, robes so fine that pumpkin hair is causing from They are very fine and of very good quality, these robes. So if my disciples honor me with regard to that, then when they see me wearing these fine clothes, then they would not they would no longer respect me, said the Buddha. If that is the case. So then Buddha goes on to say, suppose to dying, as you say, that my disciples respect me because that I am content with any kind of arms food and face doing so. Now there are disciples of mine who are arms food eaters who go on unbroken arms stall from house to house who delight in gathering their food. What is unbroken arms down from house to house? Please? They don't skip any house. If there is like say line, 10 houses, you go to each house. Okay? Because if you think that the food of that house, that person is poor, you can't choose. You know that beggars can't be choosers. There's a say no. So anyway, in the case of the monks, they can't Choose. I'm not going to this house. I'm going to. You have to go each house. You can't skip houses. That is what says the unbroken arms down. It says that's how it is translated. Who delight in so they are always they get their arms food by going for pin the part going on arms down. So it says here when they have entered among the houses, they will not consent even when invited to sit down. They don't go sit down in the houses. So they will also always accept the food on the arms round. And that is how they live the monk life. So, but I sometimes, Buddha says, eat on invitation meals of choice, rice and many sauces and curries. Then the, sometimes in the case of Buddha is invited to say the Lord's houses, even the king's houses, and then he is given very good, delicious food. And those monks who always go on arms down and live on whatever they get, they would no longer respect to honor me. If that is the case, why they respect me, says the Buddha. Then he says, so if my disciples respected me because, uh, what is the next factor? Arms would? Is it Kuti? Huh? Kuti? Yeah, any resting yes. place, any dwelling, any Kuti. Because I am content with any dwelling, any kuti. Now there are disciples of mine who are tree root dwellers and open air dwellers who do not use the roof for eight months of the year. Only for the vast season, those four months, because the vast season, you have to be in a kuti, some sort of kuti. In other eight months, they are in the open air, under, under the shade of tree. So in the open air. So this is also an austere practice. There are certain monks that follow this. So what would they think of the Buddha? When he is living in uh, very, sometimes the very, like Anatha Pindika uh, offered him a kuti made of sandalwood. No? So very, so he made a lot of gold coins to make that kuti. So what would they think of the Buddha? Would they respect and honor the Buddha when they see these monks who are living in the open air, yeah, whereas their teacher living in luxury, they might think that, you know. No, Buddha say that is not the case and why case why they respect me. Buddha says, while I sometimes live in ga gabled mansions, plastered within and without, protected against the wind, secured by doors and bolts with, with shuttered windows. That's how I live sometimes, but they don't disrespect me. That is not the reason they respect me. Then suppose Sudha in my disciples honored and respected me because of uh, 
seclusion, no? Yeah. Because I love seclusion, I pray seclusion. Now there are disciples of mine who are forest dwellers. Dwellers in remote resting places who live withdrawn in remote jungle thicket resting places and return to the midst of the Sangha once in each half month for the reciting of the party. They come out only, they gather together only to recite the party mask every fortnight. Other than that, they live in seclusion in the deep forest. They are such disciples of mine. Whereas in my case, says the Buddha, I live surrounded by bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, by men and women lay followers, by kings and king's ministers, by other sectary and their disciples. We see that no, in the suttas we find kings, ministers, lay followers come to him to talk to him, the Dhamma. So likewise, Buddha is with people, whereas his disciples are living seclusion. So if my disciples honored and respected me because I am secluded, when they live such a life in deep seclusion, they will not respect him anymore. So Buddha says, in this way of dying, it is not because of these five qualities that my disciples honor and respect me and live in dependence of me. Buddha goes on to say, but I see these five things. This is how outside, so this is like how, this is what Udayang saw. They are wanderers. They are outsiders. They are not within the dispensation. No? This is how outsiders view the Buddha. But in the case, but do, are we outsiders? In our case, we are not outsiders. We are the disciples of the Buddha. So we have to see the Buddha in a different perspective. Okay? Or else we also become outsiders. That is why we try to learn the Buddha learn the way of the Buddha, the nature of the Buddha. How do we learn and understand, recognize the Buddha? Through his teachings. That is why we have to learn the sutta, study the sutta, read the teachings again and again. So then we can glean a better understanding of the Buddha and understand for ourselves how great is our teacher to whom we have gone for the So, uh, so in this way, we can grow in confidence. A point of view grounded in faith. So it needs for this to happen. We should have a perception, a view, a point of view about this that is grounded on our faith towards the Buddha, the confidence we have. Or else we make huge mistakes. I remember like to one of our monastery, a lay person came. Okay, So uh, when you, you know, like when you fix an AC to a room, then there is that what you call that uh, radiator, you know, what you the thing you fix outside that that thing that circles the fan. generator generator huh? generator no the AC has two parts no there is the air conditioner then there is the cooling thing the fan that runs outside of the room Arjun do you know what it's what yeah, it's called? Not, not exhaust, but yeah, AC like ventilator. Yeah. So ventilator, we'll say. So that's fixed outside. So we had this now. This monastery is a very hot and hu hot monastery, hot uh, climates in there. So in that monastery, we had a certain uh, say hall that was reserved for meditation. So that was uh, air condition. Then you see this uh, part that is out of the so this lay person saw this, the village who came to the monastery. And when he went to the village, he said, each and every kuti in the monastery has an air conditioner. Okay? So that's what he saw. So that's what he grasped having come to the monastery. But that was the only room that had an air conditioner because that was the common meditation room. Because normally in our kutis, we have just a fan. In some cases, we don't have the fan either. So, but he thought, okay, it was a huge monastery and he thought like, oh, each and every kuti 
has a fan and he has spread this word among the villagers. And still to this day, people uh, talk badly of the monastery, saying those monks, they live with uh, that uh, great luxury. They have air conditioners for each and every kuti likewise. Why? Because of that first person. That's what he saw. He didn't see the virtue of the monks, their practice. And if you ask him to come to the monastery and give him all the luxuries like an air conditioner and put him in a room, can he be there? Do you think he can be away from the sensual places? Even still, he would fail. Because he didn't see the virtue, the practice, or the qualities of the man, nothing. All he saw was uh, that apparatus. And he did, thought there was an air conditioner for each and every kuti. So that's one, what happens when you see as an outside of the dispensation. You doesn't recognize the Buddha. You doesn't re recognize the Sangha, the path, the practice on by the Buddha, nothing. And I remember in Kolgala this happened. We have the Dhamma hall, huge Dhamma hall. And uh, Lokasanji wanted the people who come there to comfortably listen to the teaching. So he fixed fans for the Dhamma hall. And some got upset because of this. They said this there is too much luxury. They thought the fans are for us, the fans are for the lay <laughs> people. So that they can have the comfort of it. So you like people don't, but they they didn't they forget why they came here to learn the Dharma. And they lose what they have to gain from this dispensation. Why? Because they fail to recognize. The value of the dispensation, the teacher, the disciple, all that. So that is why we should learn these things. So, however, Udaying, there are five other qualities because of which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me and live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting. What are these five? First is the higher virtue. Here, Udai, my disciples esteem me for the higher virtue. In this way, the recluse Gautam is virtuous. He possesses the supreme aggregate of virtue. This is the first quality because of which my disciples honor, respect, and revere me and live in dependence on me. So, Buddha has the supreme aggregate of virtue. With regard to virtue, he was complete. Do you remember uh, the staff after Engli enlightenment? Buddha thought it is uh, not uh, the living without a teacher is suffering. It is not so pleasant to abide to live without a teacher. So he wanted to see whether there is someone else who was more virtuous than himself, no? Who had who had uh, who had developed concentration more than himself and wisdom. And with regard to virtue, did they see anyone in the whole wide world among the Brahmas, the Devas, or anyone? He found none that were more virtuous than himself. So when it came to the virtue he practiced, he was unsurpassed. He had no parallel. He was incomparable with regard to virtue. So uh, there's this sutta. Do you remember uh, about the what you call the Saptamaitoni Sutta? To understand the virtue of the Buddha, the link is there. Yeah. So in that say, see the virtue, uh, can understand the virtue of the Buddha. It says here the Brahmin Janswani went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. And then he asked the Buddha after the polite conversation, Dear Master Gautam, do you claim yourself to be a celibate? So he asked the Buddha, Are you a celibate? Brahmin, if anyone should be rightly said to live the celibate life unbroken, impeccable, spotless, and unmarred, full and pure, it's me. So no one lives the celibate life as pure as the Buddha, he says. 
then he asked, but what must go to me is uh, break, taint, stain, no marred. How is this celibacy tainted? How is it marred? He asked. So then how is it broken? So Buddha said, so this is how the celibate can, celibacy can be impure. So you can see, understand how pure the Buddha's celibate life is. Firstly, an ascetic or Brahmin who claims to be a perfect is celibate does not mutually engage in sex with the female. However, they consent to being anointed, massaged, bathed, and rubbed by a female. He wouldn't engage in sex, but these things he allows. They enjoy it and like it and find it satisfying. This is the break, says the Buddha. Taint, stain, or ma in celibacy. This is called one who lives the celibate life impurely, tied to the fetter of sex. They are not freed from rebirth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. They are not freed from suffering. If you lead this impure celibate life in this manner, where in the case you don't engage in sex, but you allow to be massaged and likewise, and you derive pressure from that, no celibacy. It's impure and you will not free yourself from suffering. So furthermore, Buddha said, an ascetic or Brahmi who claims to be perfect does not mutually engage in sex with men, nor do he consent to massaging likewise. However, they giggle and play and have fun with fem females. They play around. Again, then their celibacy becomes tainted, marred, impure, and they can't free themselves from suffering. And Buddha said, then that's the case, they wouldn't do any of this but they would gaze into the female's eyes and thereby they would derive pressure. If you do that, again, your celibate life is impure. It's tainted, said the Buddha. Then he said they might not do any of this, but still they listen through a wall or rampart to the sound of females laughing or chatting or singing or crying. Laughing chatting, singing, or crying. Either of those things. If you listen to the still, your celibacy is tainted and becomes impure, says the Buddha. Then Buddha says, they might not do any of this, but they recall when they used to laugh, chat, and have fun with females. So now they are living the celibate life as a monk or an ascetic, in this case ascetics. But they recollect their past lives, the relationships they have had before their ascetic life. In the lay life, they would have girlfriends, wives, or any other relationship, and they have they would have had certain dealings with females, and they uh, reflect upon this, and then you can derive pressure from that as well. If you do that, then again, your celibate life becomes impure. They see a house, or they might not do any of this, but they see a household or their child amusing themselves, supplied and provided with the five kinds of, you see them, a family living with sensor pressures with wife and children, then you derive pressure. Seeing that, then your life becomes impure, the celibate life, and you will not free from yourself for suffering. Then would they say they might not do any of these things, uh, however, they live the celibate life wishing to be reborn in among the devas. So if you live the celibate life, you practice celibacy wishing. By this practice, may I be born among the devas. Then again, that is that makes your celibate life impure, say the Buddha. So they enjoy it and like it and find it satisfying. This is a break and taint, say the Buddha. They are not free from suffering, therefore. Then Buddha says of himself, as long as I saw that these seven sexual fetters, or even one of them, had not been given up in me, I didn't announce my supreme perfect awakening in this world. It's God's Maras and Brahmas, this population with this ascetics and Brahmas, it's God's and humans. I did not proclaim myself to be a Samma Sambuddha, as long as I saw that I had even one. 
only when all these seven sexual fetters were completely eradicated from me did I proclaim myself to be the supremely enlightened one. So see how pure the Buddha's life is. So this Brahma is the excellent master work in that sense. So he goes for refuge to the Buddha after hearing this. So this is, you see how virtuous the Buddha is, no? Imagine. And he also encouraged the monks to practice in this way. So, so that is one reason why the Buddha is respected, honored, revered, and venerated by his disciples. And that is why they live in dependence on him. That is the first quality. What is the second quality? The knowledge and vision of the Buddha. Okay, Buddha says here, again, Udai, my disciples esteem me for my excellent knowledge and vision in this way. When the recluse Gautama says, I know, he truly knows. When he says, I see, he truly sees. The recluse Gautama teaches the Dhamma through direct knowledge, not without direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma with a sound basis, not without a sound basis. He teaches the Dhamma in a convincing manner, not in an unconvincing manner. This is the second quality because of which my disciple honor me. So he is very sure with regard to his teaching. If we say this is so, definitely that is going to be so. It will not change. It's very convincing his teachings. He has the knowledge, the direct realization with regard to this teaching. So we come to certain situations where, uh, you know, in the Devadutta Sutta, it is said that uh, Buddha says, after explaining the, all the suffering in the hell world, then he goes on to say, uh, monks, even I saw the thought of uh, Yama, the rule of the hell world, King Yama, he said, the King Yama, there arose in him this thought. Buddha says, monks, this actually happened. The King Yama thought, those who do such bad deeds in the world, receive these many different punishments because he see these beings now suffering. Oh, I hope I may be reborn as a human being and that a realized one, that is a Buddha, a perfect one, a fully awakened Buddha arises in the world and that I may pay homage to the Buddha. Then the Buddha can teach me the Dhamma so that I may also understand his teaching. So he wished so. Even that wish, that thought, Buddha saw. So he saw, see how his knowledge and vision is. Now I don't say this because I've heard it from some other ascetic or Brahmin, said the Buddha. I only say it because I've known, seen, and realized it for myself. That is how he saw his thoughts. So then uh, Buddha, with regard to his dependent uh, knowledge, his understanding of dependent on originism, Buddha said, after explaining the dependent origin, monks, this is exactly how this happens. This is exactly how suffering comes to be. This is the exact way suffering ends. That is the Buddha's knowledge and wisdom. Then uh, there is a very nice sutta. Uh, Adideva Jnana Dasana Sutta. The link is there. The Buddha's uh, unsurpassed knowledge with regard to the devas. Okay? Does the link work? Yeah. The link is there, no? So, at one time, Buddha was uh, in Gaya. Okay? Buddha, when he was Gaya, before his awakening, before he achieved enlightenment, okay? Buddha says, that he was, uh, after achieving enlightenment, he's telling this, mendicant monks, before my awakening, when I was still not uh, a Buddha, but intent on attaining enlightenment, I perceived light, but did not see visions. So he's practicing meditation, and Buddha could perceive light. But he can't see visions through that light. 
then it occurred to me both to say what if i were to both perceive light and see visions then my knowledge and vision would be become even more purified thought the buddha so you want to see not only light but also vision so after some time living alone withdrawn diligent keen and resolute i perceived light and so visions but i didn't associate with the deities kanna so engage in discussion first there was the light then he wanted to see the deities as well so then he practiced and then now he could see the deities as well but still he could not talk with the deities so he still purified his meditation then he could uh, then he could engage in discussion associate with those deities so this is what he say what if i were to perceive light and see visions and associate with those deities converse and engage in discussion then my knowledge and vision would be even more purified so buddha was able to achieve that then he thought but still i didn't know which order of gods those deities came from he didn't know from which order of gods they came from which uh, devas were and which order in that devas were like as he could know so he developed further purified more his mind to samadhi to concentration and he was able to recognize oh this date is from this order likewise then would the think but i didn't know uh but i didn't know what deeds caused those deities to be reborn they after passing away from here he didn't know what karma they had done to be reborn in each of those devas well so still he practiced even more and he was able to purify and then he was able to understand uh, then he wanted to know but i still didn't know what deeds caused those deities to have such food then such an experience of flesh and pain the karma behind what they have done to experience such a life in the devas well so he practiced even further and purified his mind and he could know that but i didn't know that these deities have a life span of such a length he couldn't see the life span of the deities so again he practiced meditation he in a resolute and purified his mind so he could see that as well but i didn't know whether or not i had previously lived together with those deities he didn't know whether he himself had before lived with deities he couldn't see that then again he practiced even more purified his mind through meditation and he could see that as well so he said i found out whether or not i have previously lived together with those deities then buddha says as long as my knowledge and vision about the deities was not fully purified from these eight perspectives i didn't announce my supreme perfect awakening in this world in this world with its gods maras brahmas its population its ascetics and brahmins so in this world buddha did not announce himself to be a samma sambuddha a perfectly enlightened one until he had this knowledge and vision that is the eightfold no perspective with regard to devas so see how the how profound the knowledge and vision the buddha sees no that is why the disciples respect revere and honor the buddha and live in dependence on him so that is why you know uh, the when you see the suttas we see his knowledge his understanding his vision that is why when we Uh, learn or say we read the dharma book you can't put a price tag on that no normally we give it for a price no certain price and uh, especially the mahamena on the dharma publications are very cheap so sometimes uh, even in my lay life when i read those books i wonder like when you think of the dharma content you find in the book the value the true value it can be valued for any any amount 
we see in auctions very very things that are worthless are auctioned for huge amounts of money if you can you value the teachings of the buddha think of one single sutta you can't put the price tag that much of value is there in the buddha's teachings so and when you think in in, in the case uh, it is because our loko swayangas is commitment today we are learning these teachings maybe i have said this before uh in those days in the very early days when in the of the uh, alok sans dhamma propagation he would do a sermon here in the morning in candy like no throughout the whole day next day he travels to bandara again whole day he would do the dhamma program and he didn't have a comfortable vehicle to travel to do that he had a very old van i think at those days so he, so when you do a dharma program imagine all day i don't think it's so experience any of you have to talk like to talk throughout the day it takes a lot of uh, like say you feel really tired it take a lot out of you expend lot of energy for that then when you have to do the same thing next day there are like three four days sometimes lokasan has been doing this eh? and you think when he one day he, after coming they he would do the program all day long and at night it was very late at night when he came to the monastery and the certain monk has seen that still he was not going to bed so uh, he had asked why look sign that you are not going to bed still then he, he was fighting something what was he doing he had said then we tried if i go to sleep who are the ones who is going to teach these people the dhamma so he was actually translating a sutta pitaka even after teaching the dhamma throughout the day late at night without going to sleep he was translating normally in the case when lokasanga translated the sutta pitaka from the pali to singhala he write it with pen and paper all the translation the sutta pitaka all he has said he has tried written on paper think writing all that imagine so that much of effort he has done to get it get the dhamma so let the people learn the teachings of the buddha so it's, it's unfathomable his commitment then it is typed then he would sit with the monk uh, and uh, he would read and the, the monk would type then he would proof read it again and again then only it sends so print that's how these translations of the sutta pitaka in singhala that is available came to be so even the other books everything he writes lakshayanga like say when he, he writes in his own hand writing on pen with pen and paper then only it's printed and he would read it again at sometimes four or five times proof read then it is uh, sold for like 200 rupees like we have the cheapest tipitaka books no in the case tipitaka books like even the printing cost is really high so we have we are only covering the printing print cost and a small margin so we can keep this uh, propagation the printing press going that's all so can you but put a value a price tag on the teaching of the buddha when you think of the knowledge and vision of the buddha no it is much less so 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 we are lucky in that that is why we have to make the most of this opportunity so these are the two things okay third thing first virtue then knowledge and wisdom third thing why the buddha is honored and respected by his disciples are wisdom yeah the higher wisdom of the buddha again uda in my disciples esteem me for the higher wisdom the recluse gotam is wise he possesses the supreme aggregate of wisdom it is impossible that he should not foresee any doctrine belief opinion or that he should not be able to confute that is true wrong with reason the current doctrines beliefs and opinions of others so the buddha he was he had such wisdom he knew all doctrines that beliefs or opinion that should not be able 
like it says here, it is impossible that he should not foresee any doctrine. So whatever belief, a doctrine or teaching that is still not arisen, like any form that might arise, he knows beforehand everything. That much of understanding he has with regard to doctrines, teachings, views, opinions. That is why he can easily, re that is one aspect of it. The other aspect is, uh, it says here, uh, or oh, that he should not be able to confute who wrong with reason the current doctrines, beliefs, and opinions of others. So whatever opinion or view other person might come, he can quickly prove it wrong. Why? The wisdom of the Buddha. You know, once that a certain person came, yeah, he was a person who mends carts. You know, like we have motor mechanics now who mends cars and vehicles like stuff. Likewise, this person was, uh, who mends the carts. So this person comes to the Buddha and asks the Buddha, various people come to argue and debate with you. And they raise different questions. But the moment you are questioned, you answer. How do you do this? He wanted to know. Do you beforehand think if you are, if I am asked this question, I will give this answer. So do you prepare? If there's a prior preparation with regard to this, he wanted to know. Then Buddha told him, look, in your case, now you are a person who means cards when they are broken. So how do you know when a person comes to you with a broken card? How do you know how to fix it? Okay. How do you instantly know? He said, because now this is my job. Like in the case, I have very good understanding with regard to the mechanism of the cards, how it operates. So I instantly know this is what's wrong with this. We'll say it's the same thing. I have realized the Dhamma Dhatu. The element, Dhamma element, I have realized. So I instantly know when he questions, what is the answer I should give? So that much of wisdom Buddha had, wisdom the Buddha possessed. And Buddha, uh, you know, once the Bhakthin came to the Buddha, I am of the view and opinion. I have this view that I do not. He said like, a, yeah, I am a person that does not desire any views, he said. And Buddha asked, but you desire the view of not desiring any views, don't you? So see the wisdom of the Buddha? Straight away he asked him that. So that must have subtle wisdom Buddha possessed. So he could refute any doctrine. That's what he said, the higher wisdom. So seeing this higher wisdom, the disciples of the Buddha respect and honor him. So This is the third quality because of which the disciples honor and respect Buddha. Okay? And also it says, uh, and he do not expect instruction from these disciples. He do not expect the disciples to instruct, instruct him. He instruct the disciples. And in the Mahasiyanada Sutta, I think this is here. Yes, in the Mahasiyanada Sutta, it says, Hariputta. There are certain recluses now with regard to the wisdom of the Buddha. This discuss, okay? Sorry, Buddha, there are certain recluses and brahmins whose doctrine and view is this. As long as this good man is still young, okay? A black haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, so long is he perfecting his lucid wisdom. But when this good man is all age, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage, being 80, 90, or 100 years old, then the lucidity of his wisdom is lost. But it should not be regarded so. So that some uh, in recluses and Brahmins believe that when you age over time, when you are 80, 90, 100 years old, then your wisdom also wanes. It declines with your age. But Buddha says, uh, that is not the case with the Buddha, he said. But it should not be regarded so. I am now old, eight, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. My years have turned 80. 
So at that time, Buddha was 80 years old when Buddha told this to Nenabala Arahan Sariputta. This is in the Mahasiya Nadisit. Okay. Now suppose that I had for Buddha gives a simile so that you can understand the nature of the wisdom of the Buddha. Now suppose that I had four disciples with 100 years lifespan. Perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory, and lucidity of wisdom. The stars, a skilled archer, trained, practiced, and tested, could easily shoot a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree. Suppose that they were, so these four uh, monks were even to that extent perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory, and lucidity of wisdom. Suppose that they, so that the simile of the arrow is to give an idea of how lucid and perfect their wisdom was. Okay, that is why the arrow simile is used. Okay. Suppose that they continuously asked me about the four foundations of mindfulness. And that I answered them when asked, and that they remembered each answer of mine and never asked a subsidiary question. Or paused except to eat, drink, consume food, taste during defecate, and rest in order to remove sleepiness and tiredness. So throughout, without any stopping other than for these things, they would question the Buddha, these four monks. Still the Tathagata's exposition of the Dhamma, his explanations of factors of the Dhamma, and his replies to questions would did not come to an end. But meanwhile, those four disciples of mine with their hundred years lifespan would have died at the end of those hundred years. Sariputta, even if you have to carry me about on a bed, still there will be no change in the lucidity of the Tathagata system. So they begin it, say, at the age of 80, then Buddha was, would be 180 years old. So throughout that 100 years, continuously, he can answer the questions without any problem, without any decline with regard to his wisdom. And when he is, say, 180 years old in this case, even if you have to carry me about on the bed, still there will be no change in the lucidity of the Tathagata's wisdom. That is why uh, that is the third reason why he is respected and honored by his disciples. Then what is the fourth reason? The Four Noble Truths. Again, Udayan, when my disciples have met with suffering and become victims of suffering, pray to suffering, they come to me and ask me about the noble truth of suffering. Being asked, I explain to them the noble truth of suffering and I satisfy their minds with my explanation. So when uh, disciples come to the Buddha and ask him about suffering, he explains. This is what suffering is. And they are satisfied with their answer. Then they would come to him and ask, what is the cause of suffering? The Buddha explained, cause of suffering is craving. And they are satisfied. Then Buddha, they would come to him and ask, what is the cessation of suffering? Then again, Buddha is able to satisfy his disciples with his answer. Then they would ask, what is the part leading to the cessation of suffering? Again, he can give a satisfying answer for that. Why? He has that ability. He is the greatest teacher. So in this way, because of this reason, that he has uh, complete knowledge with regard to the Four Noble Truths. His understanding, his realization is complete. When he is asked to explain, he can do so. He can satisfy his disciples. So in this way, a wise person, if he is able to see these qualities in the Buddha, he can gain in confidence towards the Buddha. This is how a disciple would should view his teacher. So we learn four things, no? Why the disciples of the Buddha should respect and honor him. What is the first thing we learn? It is because the higher of virtue. virtue. Second is knowledge and vision. vision. Third is higher wisdom. It's higher wisdom. What is the fourth quality we just discussed? Four noble truths. 
yeah he's really chasing his understanding of the four noble truths fifth is the the practice taught by the buddha the way to develop the wholesome states the whole practice laid out the buddha knowing this is what the buddha has taught us he has taught us what the four foundations of mindfulness the four right kinds of striving these things you know okay so you don't have discuss the four bases of spiritual power okay what are the four bases of spiritual power can anyone say it is in the sutras na again udai i have yeah. came to my disciples the way to develop the four bases of spiritual power okay. here we could try hard to develop the basics for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to seal so seal is the basis to develop concentration here to develop spiritual power based on your seal what is based on your effort energy determination or energy or effort then determination then wise consideration by that way you can develop the four bases of spiritual power and become arahants it says and they are by many disciples of mine abide having read the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge that is they become arahant so the five faculties you know when you develop the five faculties then again gradually you can progress in the path and attain enlightenment energy mindfulness then the five powers it is the five faculties then become the five powers then the seven enlightenment factors like sati dhamma vichya vidya priti pasaddi samadhi upekka then the noble eightfold path this was all all this was taught by the buddha yeah. then the eight liberations see you can read them okay the eight liberations not something i think we are we are familiar with the eight bases for transcendence uh asta vimoksha we say that's also in the salayata nibbanga sutta in the end of the sutta so these you can these are like a bit very deep things that even if you read you might not understand don't worry about that but just think this belongs to the buddha's realization the ten kasinas kasina meditation text like uh, you can read that the four jhanas and there are the similes also here the four jhanas and the similes inside knowledge. so this is all this are taught by the buddha yeah. inside knowledge of the body how the body is created is says again udai i have proclaimed to my disciples the way to understand thus this body of my made of material form consisting of the four great elements procreated by a mother and father and built up out of boiled rice and porridge is subject to impermanence to be worn and rubbed away to dissolution and disintegration and this consciousness of mine is supported by it and bound up with it so likewise uh, then there is a simile to so that so all this was taught by us so taught to us by the buddha buddha so we can in this way see his wisdom and grow in confidence toward him the mind made body again udai i have proclaimed to my disciples the way to create from this body another body so you can create another body having form mind made with all its limbs lucky no faculty just we have this uh, six senses all these faculties i you know stand would like you can create another mind made body this can all be done by practicing the path and he gives he gives a simile just as though a man were to pull out a reed from its sheath and think thus this is the sheath this is the reed you can pull out the reed from the sheath so in the same way you can pull out like you can recreate the mental body mind made body just like we have this coarse body and there's another simile for that just to a man were to pull out a sword from its scabbard okay what is the 
scabbard scabbard is where you the sheath where you keep the sword where the blade of the sword is kept it's made of leather or metal so that is a scabbard you you draw out the sword from the scabbard likewise you can draw this mental body out of your physical body the mind made body and the other simile just as if the man were to pull out a snake think of a snake charmer he has his uh, snakes in the basket no just as he would take it out of the basket it says here just do a man were to pull a snake out of its basket and think this is the snake this is the basket the snake is one the basket another it is from the basket that the snake has been pulled out so to i have proclaimed to my dis disciples the way to create from this body another body having form mind made with all its limbs lacking no faculty and thereby many disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge that means attainment of arahantsya then the kinds of supernormal power you know those things no all that can be achieved the divine near element understanding of the minds of others how to read the others minds each and every state and there is a beautiful simile for this how clear to understand how clearly a person can see another person's mind mm, simile is yeah just as a man or a woman young youthful and fond of ornaments on weaving the image of his or her own face in a clean bright mirror or in a bowl of clear water would know if there are a spot there is a spot like if you are going in front of a mirror you can clearly see you know if there is a spot there is a spot likewise you can see very clearly another person's mind also and you see this is this divine state likewise there is it is if it is concentrated mind if it is a liberated mind if there is anger all those things you can see clearly then the recollection of past lives that was taught by the buddha the divine eye the destruction of the tens in the end so there is a simile also for that in this way buddha say this is the fifth quality all this we describe the practice the path shown by the buddha how to develop the wholesome states all this that we discuss that in sutta you can read leisurely this sudhaing is the fifth quality because of which my disciples honor respect we and venerate me and live in dependence on me so thus there are these five qualities why the disciples of the buddha respects and honors him and live in dependence on dependent on him so this is what the blessed one said the wonder udaying was satisfied and delighted in the blessed ones uh, words so that is the maha sakuldai so uh, the great discourse of uh, made to sakuldai so you can understand no then so as disciples how fortunate we are to go for refuge to take refuge in such a remarkable teacher the buddha the supreme the perfectly enlightened one so in this way think of these things his virtue his knowledge and wisdom his higher wisdom and uh, as we uh, discussed these things with the path shown by him then you can great grow in confidence in the buddha and uh, that helps us immensely to have a good rebirth in heavenly worlds and also to under realize his teachings the confidence the faith the belief we have in the buddha also his teaching and the monks the arahants who actually when you become an arahant you get all these things you achieve all these holes and factors you can achieve So this is the only dispensation, only teaching whereby you can achieve this. So we are very fortunate to have gone for refuge to the Buddha. So may we also have the opportunity to one day, in this Gautama Buddha's dispensation, fully realize all these teachings.
sadhu 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 okay if you have questions you can ask bante yes, um uh, uh, how can we distinguish uh, knowledge and wisdom is wisdom is higher more um I, i'm not so sure so bante can you share um uh, distinction knowledge and wisdom the distinction knowledge is like uh, uh say we shouldn't think of it say with regard to the normal english usage of knowledge if that knowledge can be gained uh, by any like reading a book or whatever this is uh, knowledge you gain through spiritual growth is a sort of a realization wisdom is uh, the ability you have like you gain certain knowledge of say we say knowledge of the passing away and rebirth of the things knowledge of like recollecting the past lives so this is a certain skill a realization you gain through spiritual growth whereas wisdom is the faculty by which you see the reality the impermanence the suffering non self okay it is through wisdom that you uh, realize dependent knowledge and realize the four noble truths it is the ultimate factor that helps you to uh, progress in the path actually to realize the dhamma itself so that is the uh, how that is how you have to discern between the two knowledge in the case here is an achievement something a realization you gain okay so for all this to be achieved wisdom is the supporting factor it has to be there that is why in the very beginning buddha says uh, my teachings is for the wise not to the foolish right okay yeah thank you bante Oh, sorry, Bante. I think there's a question in the chat box, Bante. Oh. How do I pick what psychic power I want? Like, how can I choose teleportation, teleportation instead of reading minds? Is the mind made body the same as soul? That is the thing that goes outside of the body. Yeah. you can't pick what psychic power you want like uh, say you shouldn't like psychic power is not the goal actually here these are things uh, to achieve each of the psychic powers you should have the past karma you should have the merits like uh, what you can like that should not be goal like in the like arahan sariputta thera gatha he says i did i didn't have an idea a thought or a wish to be able to read others minds a wish to do all the supernatural things you do through psychic powers i didn't have a wish for that so what was his wish his only wish was to free himself from the taints free himself from suffering but along the way he in the case of venabada arana sariputta he achieved all those things likewise our goal also should be to free ourselves from suffering this sansaric journey because having the psychic powers like that doesn't help us to get rid of the sansaric journey in case of the panya vimukta arahans like the arahans liberated from wisdom they don't achieve psychic powers but they they are liberated by wisdom so you can't pick it is not a choice you if you pick then what happens that means that means you have there is a self there but the teachings are about non self so you don't have a choice but there is the practice and if you have the past merits you can achieve but still it is not the goal it should not be your goal you should the, your goal should be to 
free yourself from the awful samsaric journey. Because in our past lives, we would have had psychic powers. In past lives, we would have practiced meditation. Without coming of the teachings of the Buddha, we know there have been there are certain ascetics, they practice meditation and they can even touch the sun and the moon with their hand. That can be done through other practices. Meditations also. Like so in this case, but still, is that worth if you cannot uh, uh, realize the teachings of the Buddha, the Dhamma? You can't free yourself from samsara. You should understand the objective of the teaching is not to uh, achieve psychic powers. Buddha never praised uh, at having psychic powers. Like uh, giving, he never gave uh, value to that because that is not the uh, main goal of the teaching, the essence of the Buddha's teachings. Then also the question is, I like how can I choose teleportation instead of reading mind? You can't choose, as I said, okay? Is the mind made body the same as the soul? So there is no soul. That is the whole point of the Buddha's teaching. The mind made body is, is the mind made body. It's not the soul. That the thing that goes outside the body after death, there is not a thing that goes about. Like say, when the consciousness, it fares on, Buddha say the consciousness does not fare on its own, in isolation. There's the five aggregates, we say. What are the form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness? All of these exist together. That is why we call them the aggregate, not in isolation. So when the consciousness fares on, all the other four aspects of the aggregates, they fare on as a whole. So there is no soul. So the mind, main body, is not the soul, it is actually uh, a mental aspect of this same cause body. Okay. Mm. But they? Yeah. Astral body. So, I, so, yeah. so Astral. I have a question. So, yeah. when I'm walking around or doing whatever, when I look at myself, I see like there's a, there's, there's a there's an entity or something behind my eyes that picks up the sights, that picks up the sounds and everything. Is that consciousness? Is that is that what consciousness means? And when we talk about when we yeah. talk about the 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 magician's trick, when when we talk about the, the five minutes of the magician trick, is that part of the magician's trick? of thinking there's a me when I when I sort of see and sense these things and think it's my my smell, my my form I see. Is is that what we're talking about? Is is that is that what it is? Yeah, it is with uh, like say consciousness arises in the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. And uh, uh, consciousness is also with the God of five aggregates thing, we say Buddha said five aggregates of clinging is suffering. It is something that has to be realized, therefore. Consciousness has to be realized. And consciousness, it is with consciousness that you realize this is a present feeling, this is an unpleasant feeling, neutral feeling. Without consciousness, you can't see, hear, taste, or any of these things. Because that is how the internal and external factors, they bridge through consciousness. Okay? And the magician is like, because yeah, it is the magician, you don't see the reality. You fail to see the impermanent, the suffering, and that self. That is the magic there. You are always strict into believing something that is not there. As like you said, as like, uh, like just like you said, like the, the self-view, the view of a perception, the, the perception of a view, a self and identity view, we say. So this is there because of why the consciousness always tricks down to believing something that is not there in reality. So yeah, that's how you have to understand consciousness. So where does the thought come from? Where does so if, if that's the consciousness, where where does the thought come from? So because when I try to find where the thought or when I try to see where the thought comes from, I, I can't it, it just comes. So where 
where does that manifest from the thought thought manifests because of like say manasikara uh, manasikara means the, because of the mental awareness we say because of, if there is no mental awareness consciousness does not arise so in the satipatthana sutra it's there like uh, uh, because of manasikara uh, the thoughts and all this arise but with regard to to understand this you have to always think of these things with regard to the five aggregates okay the form aggregate okay. the feeling perception volition and consciousness like if you mix these things up like you can't realize that if you, the six senses have to be studied you know when you with regard to six senses we are think there is the eye there is the form eye consciousness unification of these is contact likewise and with regard to the mind there is the mind and the thoughts come because the mental awareness is there okay then there are okay. the mind consciousness likewise if there is no awareness then the thoughts does not arise or less there has to be the uh, mind consciousness does not arise because of mental error the manasikara the thoughts it's an external thing what you should worry about worry about, what our focus should be is not where the mind is okay but the defined okay. of the mind that is what you should focus on that is the thing you can actually deal with when you get angry you know i am angry i need to get rid of then buddha has taught you how to get rid of anger practice loving kindness likewise so like that is what you have to do do, do you should deal with the problem that is that is something you can clearly do something because it is very close to you know rather than yeah. trying to see people try to find out where the mind is whether it is in the heart it is in the brain is it, is that the problem no the issue is what defies the mind and you have to care to that then you free yourself from this suffering that's the purification of the mind that should you be a goal okay okay thank you bhante okay yeah what does so next question what does buddhism say about near death experiences where someone dies and they see their consciousness come out of their body when they come back to life and the consciousness goes back in yeah that can happen the near death experiences is something that is there and people experience this uh and i know of certain instances there was some person uh, he came to do chores for the angri mala stupa and and i think he was uh, suddenly hospitalized and he was uh, uh in that bed about to pass away uh, and he could see himself like he's like thought he was like he could him see himself that his body was operated on and like at the final moments uh, uh, he he saw all the good deeds he had done uh when like he the chores he did to the angry malasuk fortunately all of this he said he saw like a film in front of him and the moment all these things came to his mind he came back to his senses like that means he was about to pass away but because of that merit he didn't die and i know there was a case there uh, one of our uh, mother who comes to a female a lady who comes to the monastery uh, she had sugar low sugar and some people die because of low sugar also no in her case uh, momentarily she was born in hell okay but uh, when the sugar level came like the gain so merit so so is in god she was uh, she was she came back to this life so near death experience as you say didn't die but but she had uh, some minutes of experience in hell and uh, this was told to and look signs also and they and uh, but uh, now we got to know it of it somehow but still now say you were in the hell and you had that experience for few seconds few minutes we say but still you had that experience and uh, look signs had asked uh, this uh, 
uh, the daughter of that lady now house your mother now because she didn't uh, she was not that, that much into the dhamma to do merits and all that so lokasanya das now how is your mother is he more eager to practice learn be virtuous do good, good meritorious deeds because she was almost in hell she had that experience but the daughter said no she is living her normal normal life just as she, she had done before why is that because of the ignorance the darkness of ignorance we are ready to again and again be reborn in this world you forget so to have an experience that in this very life no so near death experience is a thing that actually that can happen Of course, we cannot explain all the like that's the karma is involved, dependent origination. The only a Buddha can clearly explain why that happened, what happened, likewise. But that is the thing that is there. Consciousness almost fair as one, and then it doesn't likewise. It's very difficult to explain the intricate things of that, but it is something that does happen. Okay, uh, is the Buddha the one who discovered karma and rebirth? Or was it known before? Yeah, only the Buddha. Like the others, they talked about it after Buddha. So like with regard to karma, no one has a full realization. Only a Buddha has the full realization that uh, it is one of the ten great powers of the Buddha. Dasa Balanyana, we see that he knows This is the karma, and this field will result. This is how this uh, karma will bear fruit in this life, in this form. Only a Buddha can tell that. So the only the Buddha had the full realization with regard to the karma, because yes, it is true. Because the Hindu and Jain books also mention karma and samsara and nirvana. So this is just a copy of the Buddha's teachings. They have bits and parts of it. No full realization of that. Even in the time of the Buddha, Nirgantha Nata Buddha also talked about karma, no? but he didn't have full realization of with regard to the karma. Only Buddha know how karma is created, how to eradicate all the karma, past karma, likewise. Okay. So. Uh, if you learn the suttas, read the suttas patiently. You can learn and clarify all this for yourself, and that uh, then you can clear the doubts. That is one reason we learn the teachings of the Buddha. So you can clear your doubts. That is also a benefit of Dhamma discussion. To clear your doubts. So I think it was helpful what we learned. I think it was helpful for you to what you learned today. to gain confidence in the buddha that was my objective in teaching you this thing so that you understand how fortunate that we are to have gone for refuge to the buddha